Hi, everyone, and welcome to our discussion with uh, Professor Roderick Beaton uh, on Greek independence. I'm your host, uh, Thanos Davelis, Director of Public Affairs at the Hellenic American Leadership Council. Uh, Greece and Greeks around the world are celebrating Greek Independence Day today, marking 199 years since the onset of the Greek Revolution of 1821 against the Ottoman Turks. Celebrations are taking place in Greece, the U.S., and uh, other corners around the world, but they're taking place under difficult circumstances, as we're all aware, given the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, while we remember the heroes of the past, let's also take a moment to recognize today's heroes. And as Prime Minister Mitsotaki said, Greece is facing a new challenge these days, and the new heroes are the doctors, the nurses, and everyone that's in the healthcare field providing us with uh, keeping us safe and fighting for our for our health. So from Halk and and everybody watching this, we want to say thank you to the, all the doctors and nurses and everyone. Um, and as the Greece, as Greece's new pr president, Katerina Sakelaropoulou, said, this crisis will pass and we'll be looking forward to the 200th anniversary next year to celebrate it all together. Uh, joining us now to talk about Greek independence, modern Greece's history and more is Professor Roderick Beaton. Uh, he's the author of the new book, Greece, Biography of a Modern Nation, which is a book that I highly recommend to anybody who wants to learn about the history of modern Greece. Uh, Professor Beaton is also the Emeritus Gorais Professor of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College London. Uh, he was honored by former Greek President Pavlopoulos and is a member of the Greece 2021 Bicentennial Planning Committee. Uh, if you have questions for the professor, please leave them in the comment section of our live feed so that we can share them with our guest. Uh, professor, it's great to have you with us today. Well, good morning, and it's a great pleasure to be to be with you and your listeners. So I want to kick off with a little discussion about your book. Uh, there are many comprehensive histories of Greece, uh, and there's great books from Richard Clogg to Woodhouse. Uh, most of them use this term history. and it accurately describes what they've done. Um, you describe your book, though, as a biography. Uh, why did you choose that word, which I think is typically associated with books about individuals uh, when setting the title? Well, I mean, one one reason is, um, I mean, almost you said it yourself. Those are great books. There are very good. There are um, <clears throat> there are at least three, possibly four, you know, really good one volume histories of Greece, mostly with an emphasis, perhaps all with an emphasis on the Greek state since the century before independence. And um, partly, <clears throat> I'm coming from a slightly different background. My own training and first degree is in um, actually in English literature and then in modern Greek uh, <clears throat> language and literature, not so much in history. Um, but um, also, uh, I wanted to bring a different perspective to the subject and uh, reach perhaps a slightly different Readership. So I think of my book as being, you know, it sits alongside um, the books that I think of as, you know, the, if you like, quote unquote, standard histories mm -hmm. of modern Greece. Um, one thing I wanted to do that was different was not just to concentrate on the nation state, <clears throat> but actually to tease apart a bit the different notions of the state and the nation. Um, and, you know, I think that has an immediate resonance for you in the United States, where you and I'm sure many of your viewers are part of a worldwide Greek diaspora, which goes very far beyond the bounds and the politics of the Greek state. So my book is not a history of the Greek state. I wanted to think of it as as a biography of the nation. Mm -hmm. Which you know, the nation is in part embodied in the state with its institutions, its borders, and its particular institutional history. But a nation is also a much broader, wider, less clearly defined or definable group of people, and they're not found within borders. They are, in the case of the Greeks, in any case, you know, they're all over the world. Which I think is something else that's really important about Greece and Greeks. And the book as well, it takes you through kind of a, if you look at each chapter, it's almost like you're following somebody growing up. Uh, so it starts off, you know, in, in the early stages of, you know, where someone where it's a child almost. And then, you know, there's military service, there's coming of age, there's a chapter on, you know, midlife crisis. Um, is that something that you act, you actively wanted to portray Greece as a living individual 
making its journey through through its life you could say very much very much so yes i mean it's um I mean, in part, you know, it's a little bit of a, a sort of game with uh, game with words, but it has a more serious point too, because, you know, in history, lots of people often make an analogy between nation, between states or institutions and living individuals, um, and often the analogies are taken from you know, biological mm-hmm. organisms. And I thought, well, actually, you know, let's just imagine Greece, the Greek nation, as a human subject, the subject of a biography, um, and obviously. In the case of um, a, a community like a nation, this is not time bound in the way that all our mortal lives are. Um, a nation can live who knows for how long. And I think I said somewhere in the book, you know, in the fullness of time, the Greek state or nation might morph into something else. Um, but one would certainly hope that it will never actually come to an end. Um, and um, so, you know, it's it's an open ended biography. Um, it covers basically, well, the book covers 300 years. The first couple of chapters are the sort of parents and then the the birth. What I, The revolution that we are sort of celebrating today as an anniversary, that revolution I describe as um, a violent birth. You know, the, the, the nation was really <clears throat> born uh, violently in blood. And I enjoy rather trying to, you know, think of the human individual analogies for the various stages of the nation state growing into its you know discovering its identity stretching its wings reaching out enlarging undergoing crises and good heavens the greek uh, the greek nation and the greek state certainly have um and you know maturing so the final chapter as you said you know i did risk i'm calling it or perhaps like tongue-in-cheek um you know midlife crisis but i did put a question mark after that mm-hmm. <laughs> after that chapter title so given the events of that we're celebrating today greek independence day uh i want to look back at the greek revolution you know, in your book, you give a great background on what brought Greeks to declare independence. Uh, can you give us a sense of what it was like to be a Greek in the Ottoman Empire at that time, building up to 1821? It's actually, it's quite a challenging question in that, because one thing that I, you know, I discovered researching this is that there were an awful lot of Greeks, you know, there were something like three or four million of them, before 1821, mm-hmm. they were living scattered across a very wide geographical area and completely different social classes across a range. Um, nearly all of them were Ottoman subjects, but not all of them. Um, <clears throat> some were subject to the Italian Republic of Venice, um, or others or any who lived in the Russian Empire. Um, and I mean, one one thing that I think we all too easily forget that you know the standard history, the older history, is kind of uh, glossed over is that there was you know quite a there was a well to do um highly educated in some cases quite wealthy class of individuals who spoke greek were educated in the greek language were orthodox christians but were also <clears throat> sometimes quite highly placed subjects of the ottoman empire um the term Became has become a bit disparaging. The term fanariots is often used for those that are connected with the ecumenical patriarch in the fanari district of Constantinople, Istanbul. But um, you know, if you were, you, you could be a fanariot prince. Um, you know, with titles and honours. Um, you also risk having your head cut off in public if you made a wrong step. But as long as you played your cards right, you um, you know you had quite a nice life and a lot of privileges. Other end of the scale, you've got um, peasants, <clears throat> people trying to eke a living in precarious conditions in, say, the Greek highlands, the Greek mountains and islands, with um, <clears throat> you know never knowing whether they're going to be able to bring the next harvest in. Will it be seized by pirates or the tax collector and taken away? Will they or their children starve? Um, and of course, the the could be subject to kind of arbitrary, you know, arrest or penalties. Um, so it really, you know, it really, it really very much, it very much varies. What I think is most important for us to understand is that life in the Ottoman Empire 
but in say 1800 is unimaginably different from anything that anyone knows today. It was a different kind of society. I didn't say think Saudi Arabia, but actually it wasn't. It wasn't because you know women were allowed out in the streets, and uh, um, you know it wasn't quite that either. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the Ottomans were, you know, they were entirely, almost entirely tolerant of alternative religions. Not every, it, you know, it wasn't. It was a theocracy, but it was quite a tolerant one. Um, and both uh, Christians of different denominations and the Jewish religion, they were all to some extent protected. Um, and they were not, in general, persecuted. So it's not, kind of, it's not kind of the black and white, you know, there were 400 years of slavery and oppression, and suddenly everything came right again in 1821, um, in lots of different ways. Well, you discuss a lot of that in the book, and I love that the first, I mean, for the first chapter, it kind of lays that foundation for the reader to understand, you know, what's at play, what are the dynamics, um, and even what are the questions about identity that Greeks are asking themselves? Uh, could you explore that a little bit? Well, I mean, again, that's something that's very little, it's very little known, I mean, it's almost completely unknown in the West. And even, in, you know, in Greece and among Greeks, I think it's really known, uh, it's really not much known except for specialists. But there were a lot of you know, there was a it, there was quite advanced education in several cities. It was promoted largely by the church, by the Orthodox Church. And there were many highly educated Greeks who could read foreign languages, who did read foreign languages, who wrote books of their own. <clears throat> Sometimes they published them. More often, they circulated them in manuscript. But together, their <clears throat> their efforts added up to something that we nowadays call the Greek Enlightenment. It was the equivalent in Orthodox Greek-speaking society <clears throat> to the great um, philosophical movement in mm -hmm. Western Europe in the 18th century, one of whose results, of course, I think it's fair to say, was the American Revolution and the, the American Constitution. Um, so the Greek Revolution, and indeed the way Greece became a nation state, is also the heir to that process of enlightenment. But it's very much going on <clears throat> in Greek circles already in the Ottoman Empire. So in those circles, Greeks were already asking themselves, you know, who are we? How do we fit into the into the world <clears throat> today? Um, primarily, they thought of themselves as Orthodox Christians. The most commonly called themselves in Greek, not Elines or Hellenes, but Romyi, mm -hmm. um, Romans, yeah. you know, um, the, the old Byzantine name for the uh, for the Greeks. And it was really only at the end of the 18th century that um, a group of these enlightened, educated Greeks really began to consciously to adopt the old name of Hellenes to apply to themselves. And of course, that's the official name of the Greek state uh, and of Greek people today. And uh, I think that brings us to March 25th, 1821. You know, we've set the we've set the stage Give us a little bit of a walkthrough about those days surrounding March 25th. Uh, what were the driving forces that led, the immediate driving forces that led to the revolt actually taking place? Um, and how did that revolution look in the early days? Uh, was everybody on the same page of what the outcome should be? Give us your, uh, your sense. Right. To take your, first, your last question first, they were absolutely not on the same page. And I... I mean, I actually think very few people had much of an idea of any kind of outcome. Um, things were pretty chaotic right from the beginning. It actually, I mean, it's a little bit of a myth, as I'm sure you know. It's a little bit of a myth that it started on this day, actually. And this day of the Annunciation, the Evangelismos, mm -hmm. had been chosen in advance by the secret society that was operating right through Greek provinces of the Ottoman Empire and the diaspora. They had chosen this day in advance for a kind of mass uprising, um, you know, for some entirely symbolic reasons. But they were actually preempted because the leader of the secret society, the Filiki Eteria, or friendly society, the leader of that society, um, a Russian count called Alexander Ypsilandis, actually crossed over from Russia into Ottoman territory in the Balkans um, on the uh, twenty on the twenty second of February in the old Canada, the sixth of March, in ours. So 
outside today's Greece, but in the Balkans, the revolution actually started almost a full month, a full month earlier. Um, and that uh, that was the kind of that was you know, that was the organized revolt. It started before the 25th of March and it was over three months later. Ypsilantis was routed by the Ottomans um, at the Battle of Dragashan in today's Romania in June 1821. Um, he fled into captivity in Austria. Many of his supporters and fellow fighters were killed or hunted down. And um, it, uh, the, the first manifestation of the revolution was actually a spectacular and tragic failure. But while that these events were playing out in the Balkans during the spring of 1821, spontaneously in several different parts of the Peloponnese, um, little local revolts broke out. And it's not clear to what extent they were orchestrated by the friendly society. There was this notion of the 25th of March. But again, as I'm sure you know, uh, the town of Kalamata celebrates independence on the 23rd of March. Mm -hmm. Because the people of the Mani to the south are very proud of the fact that Petrombe's Mavro Michalis led his um, wild uh, tribesmen down from the mountains to the town and took it over on the, you know, they say on the 23rd of March and made it, you know, another proclamation of independence. There was a famous declaration by Bishop uh, Yermanos of Old Patra at the monastery of the, the Holy Flame, Aya Lavra, in the mountains above <coughs> uh, Patras. That probably never actually happened, though there's a famous painting that's often... Right, I was going to say, there's a, a great painting that we see in all our Greek schools all the time. Absolutely, Ludovico, it's not even a Greek painting, Ludovico Liparini, it's an Italian painting made quite a long time later. But it's, you know, it wonderfully catches the, the, the sort of uh, ideology of it and the, the priest dominating, um, looking rather like Char Charlton Heston as Moses, Moses in the Ten Commandments, you know, with the, the standard, with the cross and the lavar held high and um, all the, the fighters and the ordinary people looking looking up to him in, you know, in, in wonder, and he's looking up to heaven. Um, so it was, you know, that's the kind of um, declaring almost a kind of holy war. Um, and it did, I mean, it did from the beginning, um, it did have that strong religious element because really rather largely separate from the political plotters of the Filiki Eteria, um, many of the leaders who were active on the ground were middle-ranking clergymen. Um, the rank and file <clears throat> very often piled in too with their flock. The highest levels of the clergy were actually much too closely associated with the Ottoman bureaucracy and they tried to, as they saw it, to save the lives of their flock by discouraging the revolution. And of course the patriarch, the highest authority of the um, Orthodox Church, the <clears throat> by that time 80-year-old um, patriarch Gregory V, despite his attempts actually to condemn the revolution, was then dragged from his church and hanged by the Ottomans on the precinct, the gate of his own precinct. Mm -hmm. um, or the gate on, remains shut to this to this day still. So. The gate remains closed ever since. Um, you know, a, a part of the, the, the terrible and, of course, completely disproportionate uh, revenge that the Ottoman authorities took. So, you know, these are all ways in which it was not an organized, planned uprising. It was a series of spontaneous local actions. And in part, I think this was because tensions had been rising for months. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Uh, there was no concerted leadership. As I say, the only really planned activity in the, uh, in the Balkans fizzled out very quickly. After that, the people in the Greek mountains were on their own. And it became, <clears throat> in essence, from these very early days, a very largely a popular movement with various kinds of leaders and potential leaders coming from different directions, trying to get a grip on events and impose a model on what should be happening. And it's a moot question whether any of them actually ever succeeded. Right. And I think you mentioned there's a number of leaders, a number of different visions, and it's not at all clear uh, what the outcome is going to be. And as you mentioned in the book, there's a number of points where leadership made the decision to actively pursue the 
the concept that you know we're Hellenes and they're going to model they're going to look back to ancient Greece to uh, to model this new country that's going to be formed. How did that play out uh, with? people that were on the ground fighting? Um, did it pose any challenges in in getting positive results? And uh, how did it affect the international view of what was going on in the uh, Peloponnese? Sure. Well, I mean, on the, on the ground, and particularly in the early stages, I don't think, I don't think it really cut much ice at all, to be honest. Um, for the rank and file, they were fighting for church and, you know, patria, which in those days didn't really mean what we mean today, the sort of the nation state. It just meant your local region, your local community. Um, so it was religion and locality. Um, the ancients were a long time ago, but the more educated of the, among the leaders realized that they were onto a real winner here because this was something that could play out in the rest of Europe. And it also played out very effectively in the United States, which you don't need me to remind you, was it, it was itself a very young country in those right. days. Um, but there was a debate in Congress, I think in 1824, whether um, the United States should actually recognize the Greek belligerents. Um, they actually decided not to, so that recognition came first from, from Europe, but, uh, you know, it was at least seriously considered. Um, and what resonated in the United States and in all, all over Europe um, was not the Orthodox Church, um, which meant either, li either, either rather little mm -hmm. or was something that, you know, people were rather kept wanted to keep at arm's length. It was this idea that the people who were fighting now were the descendants of, as the poet Shelley put, put it, those glorious beings whose very existence we can hardly figure to ourselves as having ever been, meaning the right. ancient Greeks, the founders of that ancient civilization, which included, of course, the invention of democracy, the creation of uh, you know, literature, philosophy, history, um, science, so much of all our modern world that we know. So it was the educated Greeks who got on, if you like, got onto this first because they were directly linked to the Greek Enlightenment that I was talking about just now of the previous century. But they were able to <clears throat> connect very quickly with the sentiments of people all over the civilized world um, who saw this as being, or were, were ready to see the revolution as being a moment of revival of ancient Greek civilization. And on the back of that, uh, numbers of volunteers, not large numbers, but some quite high profile people started actually making their way, usually clandestine, this is against the law, to go as volunteers and fight alongside the Greeks for the freedom of Greece against the Ottomans. And these foreign volunteers were called Philhellenes, you know, mm -hmm. literally those who love Greece or things Hellenic. Um, perhaps the most famous of them was Lord Byron, the poet um, who died at Missolonghi, not in action, but of fever in <clears throat> April 1824. But there were about 1,200, I think, <clears throat> known Philhellenes who actually went and fought in Greece. And there were many, many thousands more, possibly even tens of thousands more, all over Europe, wherever states were not authoritarian were not so authoritarian as to forbid this, because most of Western Europe, um, they were able to do this, and in the United States. There were many groups that worked together to influence public opinion, to raise money, to lobby politicians in favor of Greek independence. And what really united them was this wonderful vision of the Greeks fighting today as the descendants of those ancient Greeks whom everybody had been educated to admire so much. Yeah. It took that to be a, you know, a winning, a winning card for the, uh, the Greek cause. So I want to pull in a question from our viewers uh, and I'm going to pull it up on the screen for them to see it as well. But uh, this question is from Katerina Dimitratos and she mentions that for the first time we received an independence day message from a female president of Greece. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the role of Greek women uh, in Greece and in the diaspora in the War of Independence? Well, uh, 
Well, thank you for that question, Katerina. And I mean, I agree. Isn't it wonderful that there is, for the first time, a political leader in Greece um, who is who is a woman? The president, <coughs> president, of course, is not an executive position. It's largely a ceremonial one, but um, it's one which I mean, I have particular, also personal reason to respect, since I was honoured by the previous president. Um, and I think it's wonderful that you know that role is occupied by uh, Mrs. Sakadaropoulou. Uh, today. Um, now, I mean, Greece has lagged behind some other countries in that this is only the first time. But if you go back to 1821, there were not a lot, but there were some very famous women combatants um, who took part in the struggle. Um, Bubulina Lascaratu, I think is probably the most famous, the uh, lady from Idra, the island of Hydra, um, off the Peloponnese, who, you know, sort of man, manned, is that the right word, her own ship, um, and, you know, led people into action. Uh, Mando Maroyeni um, is, a, a, is another. Um, and, you know, I think there were, you know, there were, there were, there were prominent uh, uh, women in this, in the struggle. And, there have been women in, you know, a lot of important roles in Greece um, through the intervening 200 years, despite the fact, I mean, let's be honest, that Greece throughout all of that time until at least the 1980s has been a pretty traditionally patriarchal society, and there's no getting away from that. That really began to change institutionally in the early 1980s. And I think, um, I'm not making a political point here, I think irrespective of what you think uh, politically of Andreas Papandreou, and don't we all um, <clears throat> have something to think, um, you know, I think one thing that the first PASOK government did do that was significant was really, um, in fact, the first Mrs. Papandreou, I think, who was American-born herself, <clears throat> played a significant part in that, in actually bringing women's organisations into public life in Greece and um, opening up professions um, you know, two women which traditionally had not uh, had not been. So I'm going to bring in another question now. Um, this one's from Andy Zemanidis. Uh, in your book, you discount the Eastern question as a major factor to the Greeks prevailing against the Ottomans. Uh, you noted that by the early 1830s, the Ottoman Empire had staved off its other challenges. How remarkable is the Greek Revolution and eventual independence? Well, I mean, I don't actually discount. I mean, I don't actually discount the Eastern question. Thank you, thank you for that question. I think the Eastern question was an enormously important one, and Greece played a key role in it. Uh, some of the Greek leaders tried very hard to play a bigger role than they were actually allowed to play in reality. Um, allow me to bring in at this point my uh, my hero among the Greek. Uh, revolutionary leaders, who is a Fanariot prince in inverted commas by the name of Alexandros Mavrokordatos. Um, he was about five feet. He was about five foot six, tall. Um, wore thick, thick, spectac thick lens spectacles. He wore a European frock coat, where everyone around him was wearing the fustanella and traditional Ottoman dress. Um, he was. He was a rather pudgy little man, apparently, um, but he was most, I think he was much the most intelligent man around Greeks and Philhellenes in Greece during the War of Independence. He was a consummate politician, spoke eight languages, and he wrote a letter to the British Foreign Secretary in 1823 in which he invoked the Eastern question and said, look, the Ottoman Empire's got to crumble. If it does, you Brits and the French too, to some extent, but you, you know, Western Europeans, you really need a strong, independent Greece to fill the vacuum that's going to be left. And guess what? If you don't, the Russians are going to get in there. And the Russian bear was as much feared as by politicians and probably ordinary people as in some quarters it is today. Um, you know, the Eastern question was very much alive. And I mean, I actually think it was in response to that that appeal that I mean, Canning later became prime minister. He um, <clears throat> he was the Prime Minister of Britain at the time <clears throat> when he had died just before the famous Battle of Navarino, when the Ottoman and Egyptian fleet was sunk by the Allied fleet of Brit Britain, France, and Russia. But he really set up, set set that in motion, and that international intervention was in effect the Eastern Question in action. 
So, I mean, I agree with your question. Come 1830, Greece was not supported by Western European powers um, who tended to fall back on the traditional line of supporting, keeping the, you know, the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, alive. And as we know now, the Ottoman Empire lasted for a whole hundred years, almost exactly, after the Greek War of Independence. So, I mean, I think probably what, uh, what you're referring to there in my book, I say, well, you know, those who were looking for the Ottoman Empire to collapse anytime soon were proved wrong would be proved wrong. But of course, nobody knew that at the time. And the dynamics created by the decline of the Ottoman Empire, which was clearly in progress, um, really remained right through that period. So that the final resolution, was there ever one, resolution of the Eastern question came not in the 1820s, but in 1922 with um, another <clears throat> for Greeks, much sadder anniversary, but we will be commemorating in a different kind of way next year, um, <clears throat> the expulsion of the Greeks from Asia Minor. Uh, you mentioned Andreas Mavrokordatos as as one of your... Alexandros Mavrokordatos. Ale Alexandros Mavrokordatos, apologies. As one of your favorite founding fathers. Um, are there any other figures that you, you look to and kind of admire from this time? Um... Gosh, yes. Well, that was my, my sort of uh, sort of popular heroes. Um, I mean, I've got, you know, I, well, I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm caught by my imagination, caught by the wonderful Bubulina as well, and um, you know, I think um, Canaris was an extraordinary character. Um, the um, the I mean, he was an ordinary sailor. He he just he was he just served on the um, on the ships again from either. Um, and um, he was the one who um, led a fire ship in Chios, which, you know, was meant that you set a ship on fire, you tow it, or you, 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 um, you, you drive it towards the enemy fleet, and then you, you, everybody jumps overboard just as, as the flames take hold and the, and the fire spreads to the enemy fleet. And um, Canary said it was, a wonderful, it was wonderful at doing this, and he destroyed the um, Ottoman flagship in the harbour of Chios in 1822. Um, and he went on a wonderful, distinguished career. I mean, he became an admiral. He became, um, was he actually prime minister? I mean, he was a major figure in Greek politics right through into the 1860s. Um, so, you know, there are, there are, um, there are many and they're varied. Um, some, I mean, someone else who I find, well, a couple of people I find fascinating, but don't claim to understand are, um, are the bishops. I mentioned a little earlier, um, Bishop Yermanos of Old Patras, the one who probably didn't actually raise the standard of revolt, but was certainly an, uh, you know, he took part in action. He, um, you know, he made sermons. He preached revolution. He was in there with the, um, you know, with the people, you know, what they called in Greek a barutopapas, you know, a, a gunpowder priest. Um, but another, um, a very, a very learned, enlightened clergyman who never saw action was um, Metropolitan Ignatios of, um, in Greek, Ungrovlas. Ungrovlachia, so Hungrovlachia. He had served in Arta, he'd protected Greeks against Ali Pasha, he'd served in Bucharest, he lived the last part of his life in exile in Livorno, in Pisa, near Pisa in Italy. Um, he was very close to Mavrocordatos, and a lot of his correspondence has been published. And it's fascinating how a man of the cloth, you know, a religious man, is really expressing ideas of liberty and secular enlightenment and giving spiritual and moral advice to people in the field. And um, and how could I not mention other man who's Corais, after whom the academic chair that I held for many years at King's College London was actually named. Um, and the Greek school that I went to was named Corais as well. I'm sorry? And the Greek school that I attended here in Chicago was named Corais as well. Right. Well, we have that in common. Um, you know, I, I, have, I have some difficulty with Corais as a person. I mean, he is remembered as the, in some ways, the father of the Greek nation. He probably was the first to articulate in a sort of developed 
way in writing the idea of a free Greece taking the form of what we now call an ethnic or national state, um, partly inspired by the French, by the European Enlightenment, but also very much by some of the rhetoric and some of the more uh, the newer ideas of the French Revolution, which he lived through. He spent all his the later part of his long life as an exile in in Paris. So, I mean, Corais had libertarian ideas. He had developed ideas. He thought about freedom, about the individual. He thought deeply about rights and responsibilities. Um, in today's terms, he was a bit of, I mean, for my taste, he was a bit of a tub-thumping nationalist in a, way, in a way, you know, some of the rhetoric I don't personally warm to. Um, I think some of his morality is, I mean, he's a dry old stick. He doesn't like, he didn't like the books that I like because he thought they were immoral. And, he's not um, someone you'd want to have a beer with. But he wouldn't. I'm sure he would. I'm sure he never touched beer either. <laughs> um, so, as I say, you know, he's a very he's a very important figure and very influential. Um, not only during the revolution, but things that he wrote and all these many his published many his published writings had a lot of influence in Greece during the 19th century. Um, I mean. I mean, it's often said that he was also, that he invented the form of the Greek language called katharevousa, that was a kind of dead hand that, um, you know, was kind of not quite imposed in the 19th century, but it, um, you know, it had a kind of backward-looking effect in Greek public life. He didn't actually invent it, but he did have, again, rather old-fashioned ideas about the way people ought to be taught to use their own language, which... I think, you know, have actually been pretty controversial right through until our own time. Um, and he's also, I mean, he's obviously an important figure in the Greek diaspora. And uh, this brings us up to a couple of questions that I think I can combine here. Um, one of them is from Dean Alonisiotis, who asks, because we talked about Philhellenes, uh, but how important was the role of the diaspora? And would the Greek revolt and eventual independence have come about without its leadership? And I'll pull it up here for our audience to see it as well. Um, and the next question is from uh, Ted Diamandis, whereas building off of the question of the diaspora, Kapodistrias, who's the first uh, Kivernitis of Greece, he uh, was a member of the diaspora that came out from, from Russia. Uh, how do you view his role uh, in leading Greek and what effect do you think his assassination had on the trajectory of the modern Greek state? Okay, diaspora. I mean, it was <clears throat> it was of course a lot less in those days than it is today. Um, a lot of the Greek communities around around the world, and I'm sure this applies to Chicago as much as um, you know other places like Sydney or Melbourne in Australia. Say, um, is a result of <clears throat> you know Greeks moving from Greece or the Ottoman Empire or, or other places. Um, actually, quite a long time after the revolution, but there were there was a sort of Certainly middle class, you know, middle, they're often called merchants. And I, I sometimes wonder, you know, what exactly were these people doing? It's worth digging mm -hmm. down into that a little bit. But, you know, Greeks, Greeks were great businessmen. They were entrepreneurs. They got around the world. They were, um, they, um, they did things with ships. Um, they sailed ships. They owned ships. They crewed them. Um, and uh, they were very good at sort of buying and selling and getting around. They did that all over Europe. And a lot from the end of the 18th century becomes settled in Russia. This is how people like Kapodistrias um, came to be sort of naturalized Russian. Kapodistrias um, had a very distinguished career um, in, uh, in the Russian civil service. He became... He was, they, they had, um, for a time, the Tsar had two joint foreign ministers, and um, up in the 1810s and up until 1822, I think it was, <clears throat> um, perhaps slightly before that, um, Kapodistrias was joint foreign minister of Russia. So the, the you know the the foreign spokesman of the of the Tsar, um, Tsar Alexander, was actually a Greek from Corfu, um, and one of the things that um, I mean, what's happening during the revolution was that many of the descendants of those people or people who are living in exile, like Mavrokodatos, like Kapodistrias, um, actually, you know, they got immediately on ships. They rushed back, I was going to say back to Greece. Um, often they'd never actually been to Greece. Mavrokodatos was born in Constantinople. He first set foot in Greece in 1821. 
Um, and capital districts, again, you know, we come from Corfu, which is part of a different, um, you know, administration. Um, he first set foot in Greece in 1827. Um, so, you know, they were going back to Greece, but they were, you know, is Greeks. On, so these figures of the diaspora, they actually are very important because they tend to be people who've made it. They've got money, they've got connections. Um, often they've got links to foreign governments or foreign, you know, foreign money, which is very important as well. They are very influential. Capodistrius is an influential figure. I didn't, you notice I didn't name him among my favorite heroes of the revolution. Um, That's right. I have mixed, I mean, I, I, I think he's a very interesting character. And to be honest, I would like to know more about him than I do. He clearly has rather unlikable characteristics. I mean, he's even more austere and unbending and not one to go down the pub with than uh, Corais. Um, he really was a dry old stick. But on top of that, you know, he was authoritarian. And unlike Corais, he actually made the laws, he laid them down. Corais, by the way, loathed Capodistrias. When Capodistrias was assassinated, he said, what a shame that the, his assassins have deprived the Greek people of the honor of driving this man in shame out of Greece. But he hailed his assassins as the worthy heirs of Harmodius and Aristogeiton, the assassins of the last tyrant of Athens in the 6th century BC. So Capodistrius, very a very important figure. Um, and I think it's still debatable to what extent some of his reforms, some of his ideas, really did have a long-lasting influence. For instance, he built an orphanage in um, Aegina, and he did that with cl in close collaboration with the American Samuel Gridley Howe, who actually, let's have Samuel Gridley Howe with Heroes of the Revolution. He was a Philhellene. I think he, I'm not sure whether he bore arms, I think he probably did, may have done, but above all, he was a philanthropist. He did a lot of work for the poor and the sick. He built a hospital in Poros. And, you know, he looked out for the victims of a struggle that were, so many were just sort of creating more mayhem. And small footnote to history, how after Byron's death at Missolonghi, acquired or bought Byron's sword and the famous helmet that he was going to wear but never did, he took them back to Boston, Massachusetts. And a hundred years later, on the anniversary of Byron's death, his heirs gave them to the Greek state in honor both of Howe and of Byron. I want to take a look at next year now. Uh, you're on the committee for the Bicentennial Celebration, and uh, this question is from Stathis Theodoropoulos. So uh, you're on the Greece 2021 committee. What is something that we can all do throughout the year that can help us celebrate the bicentennial? And to add on that question, what are some of the things that you're personally working on uh, in well, preparation for the bicentennial? Right. I will. Well, I will do that. But I mean, right at the beginning of of, of this uh, <clears throat> of this um, interview, I mean, you mentioned the extraordinary situation we're all going through now. And I have to say, you know, the the thing we can all do is get over this COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic, pandemic. Um, in this, I don't know what's being said in your country, but in this country, our prime minister says several times a day, we must all wash our hands. So at the risk of being perhaps rather unoriginal, may I just repeat that message too. Whatever else we do, we can do nothing until we get over that. And uh, I just hope to goodness it can finally be seen off um, in time that the anniversary next year of Greek independence can be celebrated in all the ways that Greeks around the world and this committee that I have the honor to serve on are, you know, are already gearing up for. So, you know, touch wood, say a prayer if you're religious, um, wash your hands in any case, and let's just do all we can to get over this. But in given any luck, with if normality is restored. The committee chaired by Mrs. Yana Angelopoulou has launched a website which is live. I'm sure um, <clears throat> many of your viewers will have seen it. Um, I think it's called Greece 2021, I think, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> where members of the public all over the world are invited to submit proposals for ways of celebrating um, on commemorating the anniversary. <clears throat> and one of the um, one of the ways in which the 
<clears throat> committee of now 40 odd people that I'm on, one of the ways that you know our input is being mobilized is to um, <clears throat> to scrutinize the proposals that come in and make recommendations to the committee about them. Um, I should, um, I mean, I mean, I have no authority to speak for Mrs. Angelopoulou or the committee, but uh, my personal understanding of the way that is meant to work is that <clears throat> the uh, the hope is that you know we are we you know we hope to see lots and lots of new and original and different kind of ideas coming in from all over the place and that we will have the opportunity to funnel those together towards a sort of centralizing group that will um, uh, adopt very many of those. It's uncertain whether or to what extent any funding may be available. This committee is not, um, it is not set up to disperse funds, but it certainly hopes to promote and encourage um, activities of all sorts and it's been from what i've seen so far i mean i've i mean i've personally seen about 80 of proposals that have come in and i'm just one of 40 people looking at a whole range so they're, they're coming in um i'm sure we've taken a bit of a hit just at the moment people aren't maybe thinking about this as much as they would like to but i hope we get we get back on track uh, very uh, very soon likewise and uh, i want to wrap up with a final question and it looks about it looks at the broader context of the Greek War of Independence, and in your book you argue that when well, you argue that Greeks were pioneers in uh, in a lot of moments of world history, uh, and additionally you argue that Greece and the modern history of the Greek nation matter far beyond the bounds of the worldwide Greek community. Uh, can you give us a parting thought on on that comment from the book? Well, I mean, when I wrote that, the immediate crisis that Greece was not uniquely, but to an extreme degree, suffering was the really the fallout of the 2007 to 2008 financial crisis. Um, and for reasons which I don't need to go into now, um, you know, Greece got caught in the perfect storm and Greece and Greeks were really put through an extraordinary set of uh, privations and they, 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 they suffered appallingly. Um, but one of the things I was saying was, that, you know, Greeks at the time of the revolution were pioneers. They were actually pioneering what turned out to be an entirely new way of setting up a, a political organization, which we now call a nation state. And in the, um, in, in the, in the last decade, during that recent crisis, Greeks were, once again, they were, you know, they were kind of testing the, the limits of the financial, the financial structures of the European Union, the political structures to which Greece, unlike, sadly, my own country, um, you know, has been very consistently committed. They were testing really to destruction, their own destruction. And I think, you know, both, I mean, Greece has now come out of that stronger than it was before, but so is Europe, you know, and all of Europe owes that to uh, to Greece. Um, I don't know about the present crisis. I mean, I did see, um, I think the Prime Minister, Mr. Mitsotakis, was saying just yesterday that actually we in Greece actually acted sooner and more stringently than many other countries to bring in measures against COVID-19. And it may be that once again, Greeks are certainly living in, you know, I, my friends tell me, you know, conditions are really very tight in Greece. But maybe again, Greeks will kind of show an example to the rest of us. Professor, I'm of it. Professor, thank you again for, for agreeing to speak with us and to speak with our audience and to take their questions. Uh, it's been great having you with us uh, today to celebrate Greek Independence Day together. Uh, on that note, uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you to all our viewers. And you will have a number of, uh, of other live events scheduled for for today and for the rest of the week. So check in to our events page on Facebook to make sure that you can follow along with all of our live uh, virtual events. And on that note, I want to let you all go. Zito, Zito Yelada. Thank you for having me. Thank you.